Good. And how's everybody doing this morning? Everybody doing well? It is so good to see you here this morning. So glad to be back with you last week. Uh, Linnell and I were in Pittsburgh doing a wedding for uh, a family that has been a part of our church for a very, very long time. I watched their son grow up and had the privilege and honor of marrying them this past weekend, but it's great to be back with you today and so excited about really diving into a new series today. But before I do that, I want to just say today, happy Father's Day to all of our fathers. Can we give our dads a hand this morning? I know we're so appreciative of all of our dads here this morning, and I I just want to say here, you know, Father's Day is a great opportunity to show our love and our support and our appreciation for all of our fathers here today, so exciting to, to, to be able to do that. But it's also uh, an opportunity for us as dads to think about a, a sort of a perspective that oftentimes I know we think about, but we may not reflect on all the time, and that is the relationship that we have with our spiritual father, our eternal father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so I, I think it's always one of those times of the year where as I, as I start thinking about Father's Day and as, as my children start to wish me a happy Father's Day, that I also begin to think about that relationship I have with the Father. Amen? And so just so excited to be able to, to celebrate that with you here this morning. Before we dive into the series, I do want to mention another opportunity that we have here, and uh, it's an opportunity that's coming up Labor Day weekend, Uh, and that is an opportunity to join our partner church in Boston, Massachusetts on a mission trip. We, uh, we're going to put together a team and go up there on Labor Day weekend, uh, and we are going up there to help support them in the work that they're doing there. And so I just want to say this. We don't have a lot of details yet, but I just want to make this announcement to you this morning that if you are interested in going with us to Boston, Massachusetts and participating in the work that's happening up there, Uh, I would love to connect with you right after the service, uh, right down here in the front. Uh, I'm usually standing down here after the service, and so just come and see me, and I would love to get your name and and just uh, be able to provide you more information. And so it's going to be a a great time for our church to to go up there and to help Jonathan Mosley. You might know Jonathan. He has been here at our church and has spoke here before, and he is uh, uh, the pastor of... of, uh, Uh, Kings Hill there in Mission Hill uh, there in Boston, Massachusetts. And so I'm excited about that and uh, can't wait to get up there and help them. Well, this morning we're kicking off a new series talking about the hope of Christ. And as you know, over the last few uh, weeks, we have been going through John chapter 13 and we've been looking at the love of Christ. And we'll talk a little bit about that, but we've already walk through that chapter and so today we're kicking off at John 14 verse 1 and following and we'll be kicking off a new series that's going to actually carry us through the summer we're going to talk about the hope of Christ what Jesus is about to do is begin to offer to his disciples some words of encouragement uh, as he prepares and we've talked about this already as he prepares to go to the cross And so he is starting to make this known to them, and he will offer these words of encouragement to them, and that's what this series is going to be about. So let's pray, and then we're going to dive into the Word of God here this morning. Pray with me, if you will. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit of God, Lord, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for this incredible time of worship that we have already had this morning. And Lord, we realize that a lot of people are away. It's Father's Day. It's summer vacations are happening but God we're gathered here today to worship you to make much of the name of Jesus and to learn God from your word as we dive into this incredible gospel the gospel of John and Lord as we talk about the hope of Christ Father we recognize that as believers and followers of Jesus that we certainly do have hope We have the hope of Christ in which we press into, in which we think about, which we embrace, God, to carry us through this thing called life. And Lord, it's so wonderful to experience hope instead of hopelessness. 
And so, Father, as we dive into your word today, I pray that you would help us to, to Lord, just hear from you as we begin this series, as we begin to, to talk about something that is so important for us to understand, something that Jesus found very important to share with his disciples. Father, I pray that you would help us to set aside those distractions that may exist in our life in this moment that we may hear from you. We love you, Lord, and we praise you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So if you've been with us over the last couple of weeks, you realize that what is happening as we've been walking through the Gospel of John is that Jesus has has come to this time in his ministry where he begins to sort of embark on a very unique opportunity with his disciples. Jesus has come into Jerusalem and what we have come to recognize as the triumphal entry of Christ, coming into Jerusalem just before that time when he would go to the cross. And as he comes into Jerusalem, he finds a home in which he can go into an upper room and to be with his disciples and they can begin to celebrate this season that they are embarking on, the season of Passover. And he is getting ready to have with them the last supper that he would have with them before the cross. It's a very unique time because Jesus will offer to them some lessons from this upper room. And as we have already seen, he began by talking about, not really talking as much as demonstrating the love of Christ. And in so many ways, he demonstrated a remarkable and unconditional love that he has for his disciples. That's encouraging for us, too, as believers and followers of Christ, to know that the same love that he he demonstrated to them, he also demonstrates to us every single day of our life. But as he has now dismissed one who was identified as his betrayer, and he now focuses in on those true disciples of Christ, he begins to make this announcement that he is about to leave. He is no longer going to be around with them. He is no longer going to be with them. And this isn't the first time that Jesus has made mention of this in the upper room. John chapter 13, we saw where Jesus had already said something along these words where he, he's beginning to let them know that things are changing, that they are going to be on their own. And this is no doubt a cause for great concern to them. They certainly have come a long way with Jesus. They've been walking with him for three years. They have been a part of his life, and, and for him to suddenly sort of drop this bombshell on them that he is leaving. Jesus is literally saying to them, I only have a few hours to live. And as we can imagine, the disciples were now just really numb with all kind of emotions that go along with hearing this devastating news. I think about this and I wonder what I would have experienced had I heard those words without having the knowledge of the gospel and how it all turns out. You know, them being with him in this upper room and beginning to hear this news, what emotions might sort of well up in my own heart. Would it be fear? Would it be something that I would fear the future, not knowing if I can do this without Jesus' presence in my life? Would it be concern? Would it be despair? What would I be experiencing had I been there along with these disciples? The reality is we know they were concerned by their reaction, how they respond to what it is that Jesus is sharing with them. They'd spent the last three years of their life walking with Jesus, going from place to place. They had spent a long time with him, and they were very close. This was a brotherhood. This was a group of men who were very close. There was this this relationship that is, is really unlike many of the relationships that we may even have 
in our life today. And so here we have these, these guys who have been walked with Jesus, and suddenly Jesus brings about this, this conversation where every good plan that they could have imagined being fulfilled suddenly coming to a screeching halt. Everything that they imagined would play out is suddenly changing on them. And they are not sure how to handle it. But there's something about Jesus I hope you know by now. There's something about Jesus that I hope you have learned about him and this this that Jesus doesn't leave us hanging amen and he didn't leave them hanging either in other words he is preparing to leave this is something that is going to be very difficult for them is something that they are having to process but at the same time Jesus offers to them these words of encouragement it's as if the next few moments that Jesus is going to pour into them He's basically saying, guys, you can do this. I've prepared you for this moment. I've given you everything you need to be ready. He's even going to tell them later, I'm going to send a helper to be with you. They're not going to do this alone. But these words of affirmation, these words of encouragement that Jesus offers to them basically says this, I care deeply for you and I will never leave you nor forsake you. This is what Jesus is doing. And the message that Jesus brings to them as he makes this declaration, I'm about to leave. I'm no longer going to be with you. In fact, I'm about to accomplish that which I have come for. He's about to go to the cross and die a horrible death. He now says to them, let not your hearts be troubled. If you haven't already, turn with me to John chapter 14, verse 1 and following. We're going to read 14 verses here this morning. But the message that Jesus brings to them is a a simple message. Let not your hearts be troubled. I want you to just allow that to sink in as we prepare to read this together here this morning. Read with me, if you will, John 14, starting with verse 1. Jesus says this. He says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. He says, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus says to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip says to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. 
You know, there are several Christian virtues that are very important to us as believers and followers. Faith is one of those. It's foundational to who we are, right? Faith is, is a virtue that we must have. We must hang on to just knowing Christ. The Scripture tells us that we are saved by grace through what? Through faith in Christ Jesus. Another one is love. We just talked about love in, over the last few weeks. And love, the love of Christ, is something that we learn a lot about and hang on to as believers and followers of Christ. But we are also to love one another as Christ loved the church, right? So we, we understand that. We understand that love is a very important and foundational virtue for us as believers. But equally important, of those two is another one, and that is hope. Hope is one of the prevailing virtues of the Christian life. You see, it is hope, the hope of Christ, that we have as, as a gift of the Holy Spirit of God that produces in us joy and peace. And I, know, I don't know about you, but I, I'm pretty certain that you, as much as I do, we are thankful for joy and peace, right? They're, they're just to, to have joy in the midst of difficult circumstances, to have peace, the kind of peace that surpasses all understanding, those are great things to hang on to, especially if we are walking through difficult times. And it's hope that produces joy and peace in our life. Hope is what carries us through those moments of despair, carries us through moments of suffering. Hope is what carries us through those moments in life where our circumstances don't give us a reason to be joyful. And yet hope helps us to endure. That's what hope does for us. And so as Jesus begins to transition away from demonstrating what love might look like for us, he begins to offer these lessons of encouragement to his disciples. And one of the things that he really drills down on is this idea or this truth of hope. You see, those who hope in Christ lean into and trust in the promises of God so that we may prevail in life's most difficult and challenging situations. Amen? Amen. It's hope that gets us through. But there are so many things in our life that if we're not careful can demolish or erode the hope that we hang on to. There are situations in our life that seem to spring up out of nowhere, things that maybe we're not expecting or looking for that sort of come into our life, these difficult circumstances, and they have a way of beating us down. Even as believers and followers of Christ, these circumstances have a way of sort of causing despair in our life. And what begins to happen as we begin to despair, as we begin to, uh, to, to be discouraged by these circumstances, if we're not careful, we begin to lose hope, that which is so important for us as believers. Oftentimes our circumstances can just sort of press in really hard and constrict life, the life out of us, and we can begin to worry, we can begin to be troubled, and what we tend to walk around with when we're dealing with these circumstances is a troubled spirit. Not one who is believing and trusting in God. Not one that is hanging on to the hope that we have in Christ. But one who feels the, the weight of this world and we don't know how to handle it and we become overwhelmed by it and we suddenly begin to lose hope. Job, who was no stranger to hard times was declared by the word of God to be one who was blameless and upright. And yet he struggled with this. He struggled when life got so difficult. He felt the tension between hope and hopelessness. 
He once said this, we, we read where he says, For the things that I fear have come upon me, and what I dread befalls upon me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, but trouble comes. You ever felt like Job? You ever dealt with something so hard and so overwhelming and so concerning that you, you feel as though you have lost the grip that you once had on the hope that is in Christ? The Apostle Paul also struggled with it. Very godly man, one who had surrendered his life to living for Jesus, one who fully understood the gospel and what it meant to him as a, a true follower of Christ, one who had sold his life to, to be a follower of Christ Jesus and go into the world and proclaim the gospel. That is the good news of Christ. The Apostle Paul also recognized the struggle between hopelessness and hope. He knew clearly that he needs to hang on to Jesus and that in Christ Jesus, he has victory. He can have hope, but no doubt he felt the anguish of life many times in his life. He once wrote to the Corinthians, he said this, he said, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. The reality is he seems to have a good grip, but the, the fact of the matter was he still dealt with those life circumstances that he recognized had the ability to discourage him. Many godly people today I know pastors and that have called me. I have called other pastors who, 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 as we share with one another the things that we are going through, many pastors are ready to wave the white flag of ministry because they've sort of lost hope in the calling that God had given them. Life is hard. How many of you would agree with that? Life is difficult. And there are going to always be those moments in our life that come our way that cause trouble in our life. Well, the disciples were no different. These men called by Jesus himself to walk with him, to do life with him, to carry out a mission, even after he was had, would ascend into heaven. And it's at this moment, it's at this time in their life where everything is going great that suddenly Jesus says, I have some news for you. I'm not going to be around much longer. You're going to have to carry on life and carry out the will of the Father as we have talked about over the last three years. In our text, Jesus encourages his disciples not to worry even as he prepares to go to the cross. But knowing their anguish, knowing their despair, knowing their concern, Jesus spoke on the issue. And as we look at this, there's no doubt as we see these words of encouragement that Jesus would offer to his disciples, we can also embrace these words of encouragement. Amen? Amen. We can learn from the text. We can learn from that which Christ is teaching his disciples and thus ultimately teaching us as well as we begin to dive into this. Knowing that they were confused about him leaving, knowing that they feared what it might mean, Jesus offers the most comforting words to them. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. You know, as I think about some of the most difficult things I have gone through in my own life. And even as I think about some of the difficult things you have gone through, I know many of you here in the church, I've ministered to you, I've, I've been a part of your life, I've walked with you through the difficult times that you have walked through, and I know the troubles that you have experienced in life. And 
whether it's me we're talking about or whether it's you that we're talking about, we, we, we love these words, let not your heart be troubled. We can find them to be very encouraging, but I also wonder what it might be like if these simple words that Jesus offered, let not your hearts be troubled, I also wonder if these simple words of Jesus were only enough. I can't tell you of the difficult times that I've been through in my life where somebody came up and said to me, David, you got to trust the Lord. You got to trust the Lord during this time of your life. I know you don't understand what's going on. I know that you, this is probably the, what you feel is the most difficult time in your life. And, but let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in Jesus. Have you ever been there before where somebody sort of came and, and no doubt they're offering these words to us to encourage us, knowing that Jesus offered these words to his disciples to encourage them. But I got to be honest with you. I got to be transparent with you. There have been times where I just needed something more than that. Because you see, I was allowing hopelessness to, to, to come into my life. I understood clearly the hope that I had in Christ. I understood that Jesus is the answer for everything. I understand that Jesus is sufficient in all things. I know the truth about Jesus, but my circumstances are so difficult that what I feel is a little bit of hopelessness. And sometimes these words just may not be enough. In fact, as we look at the text, we see two of the disciples who struggled with these words being enough. Thomas and Philip, both, they, as Jesus offered these words, they both question what is happening. Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. And these two men, at least these two, probably the others, but they just didn't speak up. But at least these two men were like, well, Jesus, we need a little more explanation than that. We need a little more than just let not your hearts be troubled. And so here's what's so remarkable about Jesus is that he understands that sometimes we need a little more. And so here's what he does. He offers a little more. He offers a little more. He doesn't stop with just that. He, he says, let not your hearts be troubled and then he continues to move on. So what is it that Jesus offers here that helps us not feel despair in times of trouble? For one thing, he says this. I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. So here's what Jesus says. He says this. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. That's what he says. That's where he starts. But he continues knowing that that might not quite be enough for them to, to be encouraged, to feel the hope that they so desperately need in these moments. And so he says to them, I go to prepare a place for you. Now, I don't know if you see the significance of that or if you understand how significant that might be. We're going to look at that. But I love what Pastor Kent Hughes has to say about this one particular verse here when he says these words, and I think these are so powerful. He says, an effective guard against having a troubled heart is to believe that Jesus Christ is preparing an eternal place for us as individuals. You see, what Jesus does is he offers an eternal perspective. Because what we do so often when we face life circumstances and they are not good is we look at the now. We focus on the present. We don't have an eternal perspective because all we can see is the trouble that we find ourselves in this one moment on this earth in this life. And so what Jesus offers beyond 
just merely the words of let not your heart be troubled is he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And he provides for us an eternal perspective that is also meant to encourage us during this time. Whether we recognize it or not, as believers, certainly we all have a desire to live in the presence of Christ. Amen? We want to know that He's still here. We want to know that He is walking with us. Amen? We want to know that even in the midst of our most difficult trials that we face in this life, that Christ is near. And here, as he shares with his disciples that he is going away, he says, I'm going away, but there's a purpose in me leaving. And that purpose is that I go and prepare a place for you, a place that we know is a place called heaven, right? A place that awaits us as believers and followers of Christ. He says, I go to prepare this place for you. But let me just say this. This is not an empty promise. This is not just sort of a, an empty talk that he is presenting. To, he's not just saying, there, there, be encouraged. He is offering to them an eternal promise that awaits for them. I go and I prepare a place for you. I go and I make a, a, a place where we will all be together. And then he emphasizes his commitment with an even more powerful promise promise one that certainly should encourage us as believers and followers of Christ when he says this he says in verse 3 and if I go and prepare a place for you look at this I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am you may be also Jesus says this this separation if you will that you're about to experience, it's only temporary. You see, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and there will be a time in my life where I will come, and I will take you to myself. I will bring you with me. Where I am going, I am preparing a place that you can't even imagine, and I am going to go, and I'm going to get this place ready for you, and I'm going to, I'm going to prepare. I'm going to make all the preparation, but don't you fret because there will be a day when I come back for you. Words of encouragement, words of hope, hope. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, David, what about this circumstance that I find myself in? Well, that's called life. And life is not always fair. Amen? It's just not. But Christ is bigger than everything else that we could ever experience on this earth. And the words that he offers to his disciples are meant to give them hope. Hope. Let not your hearts be struggled. I think it's interesting that when we have the realization of an eternal home, how that becomes for us rest for our souls. But we've got to realize it. We've got to understand it. That these aren't just empty promises that Jesus made. These aren't just fluffy words of encouragement but this is truth and realizing the truth that Jesus is speaking into our hearts is rest for our souls there's something else that Jesus says here though Something else that I believe is even more significant than what he has already said. 
And it's really an answer to a very practical question that Thomas has asked. You see, I mentioned a while ago that there were two people. There was, there was one, Philip, who said, show us the Father. And he says, have you not been with me long enough that you know that when you see me, you see the Father, right? He sort of rebukes Philip during that time. But then Thomas is one who also has a question. It's not that the words, let not your heart be troubled, are enough. I mean, certainly those are encouraging words. The, the Lord Jesus Christ saying to us, let not your hearts be troubled, certainly would encourage us. But, but Thomas, who was one who even had at times in his life some doubt, he comes to a place and he still has one lingering question that remains. One question that he still needs a little guidance on one question that still is gnawing at him and he he's bold enough to ask Jesus about it in verse 5 this is what it says Thomas said to him he said Lord we do not know where you are going Jesus says you know where I'm going Jesus had been talking about this for three years they knew they weren't getting it but they knew he says, you know where we're going, and he says, he says here in verse 5, he says, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and then he asked the question, how can we know the way? How can we know the way? You know, this question that Thomas asked is an age-old question that every spiritual person who has ever lived on this earth has probably asked, how can we know the way to eternal life? Amen? It's something that we all have questioned in our own life, whether it was before we heard the gospel or whether it was during the hearing of the gospel when someone was explaining to us the reality that we are all sinners who fall short of the glory of God and that the wages of sin is death and that our only hope is eternal salvation through Christ Jesus. Every spiritual person that has ever walked on this earth has always wanted to know, how can I have eternal life? Can I live beyond this life? And Thomas asked this question. He says to Jesus, how can we know the way? And Jesus offers to Thomas the answer. He says to Thomas in verse 6, he says, it says, Jesus said to him, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And then he goes on to say, no one who comes to the, no one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. But there's something even more significant about what Jesus has said here. If you notice, what Jesus says here is he says, I am the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And this, this phrase, I am, is a very important phrase. For him to use this phrase, I am, this is actually the sixth time in John's gospel that we see this phrase being used where he declares, I am. And there's something really important about what he's saying here as he declares, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No doubt those things bring serious implications into what we need to understand as true believers and followers about Jesus Christ. But when he says, I am, when he makes this statement, these are the words that reflect the very name of God. He is declaring for himself that he is God he's already said to them when you see me you see the father the father dwells in me and I in him 
It's a statement of divineness that he is presenting to them. And he says, you want to know the way, I am the way. You want to know the truth, I am the truth. He says, you want to have eternal life, I am the eternal life that you so desperately need. They have standing in their presence the very answer to Thomas's question. How can we know the way? Jesus says, Thomas, you know the way. How can we know the truth? Thomas, you know the truth. If you know me, you know the truth. Lord, how can we have eternal life? Thomas, if you have me, you have eternal life. And then he goes on to say this, and there's no other way. There is no other way. Thomas, I'm about to leave and I'm about to ascend into heaven and it's up to y'all to carry this ministry through and you need to be sure that as you go out into the world and you tell the world that when people say, well, I trust this one or I trust that one, that you say, well, I'm sorry. There is no other way. Because what Jesus says is I am the way, the truth, and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. It is the name of God and His power and His authority that Jesus has just now claimed as His own. One of the most powerful things that Jesus has ever said in all of His ministry. And our greatest comfort comes from trusting in Jesus and only Jesus. Here's what I realize. That as we go through life, we're going to go through hardships. We're going to go through moments of despair. We're going to have things happen to us that we never imagined happening to us. We're going to have to live through some of life's harshest situations. We're going to have to deal with things that we never expected. And here's the thing. We're going to, we're going to lose sight of the hope that we have in Christ. If we're not careful, we'll let the circumstances of our life be greater than the God that we follow. We cannot let that happen. And what Jesus does here is he says, do not lose focus on what brings you the greatest comfort in life's most difficult pains, in life's most difficult hurts. Don't forget, I am your comfort. By embracing Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life, we can navigate through life's uncertainties. And quite honestly, that's the only way we can get through it. We find His comfort in His teachings, and that enables us to build a deeper and more meaningful relationship with our God. In our great, greatest moments of pain, Jesus is always telling us, even in the darkest of times, let not your hearts be troubled. And he even tells us how. Believe in God. Believe also in me. That's what he says. If you have a need this morning to speak to one of our pastors, they'll be down front in just a moment. If you want to come to this altar and just spend some time with the Lord, maybe come to this altar and in a time of prayer, just give thanks to the greatest of fathers. Amen. Amen. Our eternal Father, who is the perfect example 
for what fatherhood should be. If you want to come and speak to me, I'll be down on the front row. If you want to come and just spend time in prayer and thank God for what He's done in your life. If you want to have more information on how you can know Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life, we're here for you. And in this last song, as we stand and sing this last song, this is your time to respond to whatever it is that you need to, you need to do in whatever way you feel led. So let's worship together the one who is the great I am. Amen? Amen. Let's worship Jesus.